1874, the Canadian wilderness, vast and untrammeled, was still being probed by men of the Canadian Pacific Survey. Hundreds of them were risking their lives trying to find the best route to carry rails across the continent to the Pacific. from the political maneuverings in Ottawa, the endless surveys went on, exploring, measuring, and mapping the unknown crannies of the nation. And then, in Ottawa, catastrophe. Alexander Mackenzie's years in office began and ended in disaster. On January 26th, 1874, just three days after his election, an old barrack building on Parliament Hill went up in flames, and with it went the records of the Canadian Pacific Survey. And that meant that almost three years of heartbreak and hardship in the wilderness had all been for nothing. Mackenzie was swept into office in a landslide election as leader of the Liberal or Reform Party. He was supposed to clean up the corruption and confusion surrounding the Tories' Pacific scandal. But now, with the legacy of John A. Macdonald's national dream facing him, his troubles were only beginning. I would say that one of his minor ordeals was the compulsory visit to the fashionable studio of William Topley, the Ottawa photographer to have his official new portrait taken. that you do now, Mr. Tumbler. <laughs> Patience, Prime Minister. Patience, we're almost there. Being obliged to this photograph, Mr. Topley, I came here entirely prepared for patience, but not endurance.
Just a smile, please, Prime Minister. A slightly more jovial expression, please, Prime Minister. Just a smile, please, Mr. Mackenzie. I am smiling. Very well, then. <clears throat> Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we are. Now, just one more, please, Mr. Mackenzie. Must we do more of this? I can't bear to stand no, still no. so long. <laughs> Now that I am First Minister, I must be willing for that sort of thing. I dare say. Alexander Mackenzie, the primest of our Prime Ministers, a blunt, unbending Baptist, as rigid as the granite he used to carve up in his days as a stonemason. As a clear grit liberal, he was dead set against what he considered the spendthrift railway policies of the Tories. But uh, as Prime Minister, he could scarcely ignore the pledge that Johnny MacDonald had made to B.C. to link that province with the rest of Canada by a line of steel. And so there was Mackenzie, caught between the pull of that clamorous province on the Pacific and the relentless tug of his cabinet colleague, the implacable Edward Blake. This was the man with the real power in the Liberal Party. Very curious creature, Blake, uh, baffling in many ways. Absolutely brilliant, seething with ambition, but far too sensitive, really, to be a politician. Even an imagined slight uh, could literally cause him to burst into tears in public. With his Ontario background, he was the rallying point for the anti-British Columbia feeling. And within the party, he was a popular alternative as prime minister. He was the one man whose support Mackenzie had to have. But Blake's opposition to the railroad was so strong that it was doubtful he'd continue to serve in Mackenzie's cabinet if he thought more money was going to be squandered on it. And here is the elegant arbiter in the growing clash between East and West, Governor General of Canada, Lord Dufferin. Very dapper nobleman and a bit of a ham. Dufferin got a lot of his wit and his charm from his Irish ancestor, the playwright Richard Sheridan, bored by Ottawa. He was positively itching for a chance to show off his talents as a then. diplomat, even if that meant One, dropping two, his official three, neutrality. Four, five, six. Thank you. Dufferin was genuinely concerned about Canada's nationhood and was quite prepared to bring Mother England into the fray, a move that was calculated to bring utter dismay to the face of any Canadian politician. And there was poor Mackenzie, caught in the middle. In addition to everything else, he insisted on being his own Minister of Public Works, the self-appointed new broom that would sweep the taint of the Pacific scandal right out of the government offices. Clean up the corruption, build the impossible railway, pull the country together. These were the tasks that this solemn and slightly dyspeptic Scot had taken on, and he actually believed he could do them all. <laughs> Certainly the Eastern voters were solidly behind the Liberals. To them it would be nonsense, and bitterly expensive nonsense at that, to pay out good money for a mammoth railway project just to satisfy a handful of people on the distant shores of the Pacific. But to the new province on the coast, the East was reneging on its bargain. B.C. had joined Confederation on the strength of a promised railway. But now, three years later, where was it? And in Victoria, the people were demanding even more than had been promised. They wanted a rail link all the way to Vancouver Island. Without it, the economic life here might soon wither and die. On the mainland, they didn't care whether or not the line reached Vancouver Island as long as it went through their own settled areas. 
So with BC quarreling over the route and clamoring over the delays, Alexander Mackenzie took office. He was sincere enough and hardworking too, but I'd say that there was more than a grain of truth in a remark once made about him, that his strong point as a political leader consisted in his having been a stonemason, but his weak point consisted in his being one still. Now he had to try to persuade Blake to remain in his cabinet, and he was trying to hold down two jobs at the same time, Minister of Public Works as well as Prime Minister. It was a back-breaking task. He didn't have a secretary. He wrote all his own letters by hand, and he was constantly besieged by political friends and their relatives. Fraser, is it? Yes, sir. And what is it you want? A job? Yes, sir. What sort of a job? I don't know. Sir. And your qualifications? Well, uh, I got school. Good. Excellent. In that case, you'll be prepared for the examinations, won't you? But what am I to be examined in, sir? Greek. In the Department of Public Works, of course you must have Greek and Latin. Writing, spelling, composition, mensuration, algebra, geometry, to say nothing of the more common arithmetic. And, uh... Oh, yes, Fraser, and oratory. Now you go right back through that door and you tell Mr. Beverly that you require to be examined. Yes, sir. Make certain now, Fraser. I want all the boys and the gentlemen waiting out there to hear what you have to say. Yes, sir. You're Aaron Fraser, son, aren't you? Yes, sir. Aaron Fraser? Yes, sir. Doesn't he vote for MacDonald? Yes, sir, but only sometimes, sir. Blake, look at these letters. This is the horror of political office. All the favors that friends and acquaintances automatically assume will be theirs. Judging from your tactics with that young man, you seem to have the upper hand. Aye, and for the time. Mistress Mackenzie was asking after your well-being. All right, you have something you wish to say. Something I doubtless dread and would prefer you not to say. This. Oh, your accursed integrity. I suppose this is final. Put it this way, my writing's not too bad. I can spell. I have arithmetic, geometry, algebra. Even my oratory is passable. But I have no Greek, Mr. Mackenzie. And like that young man out there, I have a fatal terror of examinations. How can you joke? Because I see it as a joke. We fought for power. Now we have it, and we can't see eye to eye on how to use it. That is either a tragedy or a joke. And for the moment, I prefer the joke. Good day, Alex. <laughs> So it had finally come, Blake's official resignation from the cabinet.
Unlike Blake, Mackenzie felt obliged to take a stab at building John A. McDonald's impossible railway. So he made a cautious beginning. The line would be built in sections as a public work. Lake steamers could make connections out to Thunder Bay and rails could push on towards Winnipeg. But then came the mountains. Did all those surveying delays come from practicalities or from politics? We can't be sure. But plotting a route to the Pacific would mean plenty of headaches for the engineer-in-chief, Sanford Fleming. But, uh, on the other hand, to uh, take the road this way would lead through land of agricultural potential. And we must not forget the consequences of building our railway, the effect it will have upon the development of the country. Now, over here, Mr. Fleming. I do agree with your approach, which is admirable. Now, you have your decisions to make uh, about this railroad, and I have mine. As a matter of fact, if your difficult decisions were delayed with justification, then my equally difficult decisions would also have to be delayed. Is that not so? Absolutely, Prime Minister, but as I was One about to say... One moment, if you would. I must have your assurance that these delays cannot be accounted as political, but are necessary from a strictly engineering standpoint. Well, you realize what I am saying, Mr. Fleming? I can assure you, Prime Minister, that any delays that are accountable through this office are entirely necessary and entirely to do with engineering. And I'm prepared to make that statement to anybody. Good. By now, Fleming was considering 12 different routes through British Columbia to seven different harbors on the coast. His own trip west in 1872 had shown him what the railroad builders would be up against and what the surveyors must contend with. He'd already decided which pass would take the line to the Rockies. It was going to be the Yellowhead. But he still kept sending parties out to examine alternate choices just in case. In January 1874, a survey party under E.W. Jarvis was dispatched to investigate the remote Smoky Pass. Jarvis approached the Rockies from the west to the bitter cold of a mountain winter. He and his men struggled over a territory that still had not been mapped. They camped out in temperatures that dropped to 50 below zero, with only a blanket apiece and a cotton tent to keep them from freezing to death. On one memorable occasion, while they were making their way along a snow-covered river, they suddenly found themselves perched upon a ledge of ice at the top of a frozen waterfall 210 feet high. When they eventually made it back to civilization, they'd been on the trail for 116 days. They'd traveled almost 2,000 miles, and they were on the very edge of starvation. It was a terrible price to pay. We are asked to begin at once, though we cannot find the route. And yet, until we have found the least impracticable route through that sea of mountains, it is folly to talk of the work of construction. Well, 
I believe it is the right of British Columbia to prosecute where they can that Canada should fulfill its bargain. But I deny there is any reason we should plunge this country into ruin by their attempt. <laughs> Let me say to you that if under all these circumstances, the Colombians were to say to us, you must go on and finish the railroad according to the terms, or take the alternative of releasing us from confederation. Then I should take the alternative. It was small wonder that Ontario farmers cheered Edward Blake's denunciation of the railway by the fall of 1874, when he made that famous speech at Aurora, the whole country was in the grip of a serious depression. Grain prices collapsed, farmers fled the land and crowded into the towns where already there wasn't enough work to go around. Like so much else in Canada, the depression had been imported from the United States, touched off by the spectacular failure of the Northern Pacific Railway. Soon other industries were in trouble on both sides of the border. Without American markets, the Canadian lumber industry slumped. Shipping came to a standstill. Almost 10,000 Canadian businesses would fail. and poverty spread across the nation. It was hardly the time to start building a transcontinental railway, but the Liberals had to make a show of beginning. And so on June 1st, 1875, at Thunder Bay, the local citizenry turned out for the turning of the first sod of the railway's eastern terminus. There had been another first sod turning ceremony at Esquimalt, out on Vancouver Island, the proposed western terminus. But that was about as close as British Columbia had come to getting the long-awaited Pacific Railway. If the railway was ever to reach Vancouver Island, it would have to come this way, Butte Inlet, the only one of Sanford Fleming's several routes that could conceivably reach beyond the mainland. This long Pacific fjord could connect with several passes in the Rockies by a series of interior river valleys, but you could hardly call it Fleming's route. It really belonged to one man the man who fell in love with it when he first saw it in 1872, Marcus Smith. And he was one of the most controversial figures in the whole Canadian Pacific Survey. Tough, quarrelsome, stubborn. Smith was absolutely dedicated to these spectacular canyons that led to Butte Inlet, about 170 miles north of the future site of Vancouver. He was notoriously hard on anybody unfortunate enough to work for him, but he was just as hard on himself. In his 60th year, Marcus Smith was still scrambling around his beloved canyon cliffs. And then he was called to Ottawa. By the spring of 1876, Sanford Fleming was completely exhausted and ordered by his doctors to take an extended leave in England. He had no idea what he was in for when he proposed that Marcus Smith should take his place. It gives us precisely what we want on the mainland. The railway runs to the Butte Inlet. There, there, look at it there. Down the inlet, across Georgia Strait to the island, down the island, all the way to Esquimalt. There you are. Are you saying 
that you want to bring the road down this grueling 50 miles of granite cliffs and that you then want to leap 29 miles of water to the island? Yes. At Butte Inlet, there was no place for the railway to run, no place to build a terminus, and no good anchorage for ships. It would mean eight miles of tunneling and untold rock cuts just for the right of way along those sea-torn cliffs. And then the track must hop over to Vancouver Island, across six deep intervening channels where the riptides sometimes tore through at nine knots. It would take 8,000 feet of bridging, and in two places, the spans would have to be 1,300 feet long, greater than any arch then existing anywhere in the world. What you propose, Mr. Smith, would require work of a most formidable character. Of course, but... On the other hand, as you have so endlessly pointed out, the route does have certain advantages. Ah, yes. On the other hand, when you come right down to it, any further discussion of Butte Inlet is, well, it's somewhat irrelevant. Irrelevant? Somewhat, yes. Since the terminus, after all, will really be on the island. Oh, you see my point. You'd not be wanting any anchorage at Butte. On the other hand, when one considers the cost of bridging the channel in order to put the terminus on the island, well, it will surely be unprecedented in magnitude. Although, who knows? One day, British Columbia will be a very rich province indeed, and will be able to afford 500 bridges. Besides, the uh, exigencies of the future may render a, an unbroken line of rail even as far as the outer shore of Vancouver Island indispensable. At any cost. Whatever. On the other hand, um, the other, the Parad route, it would be infinitely more expensive to construct than that route of yours, than, uh, than Butte. Oh, one simply does not know. On the other hand, the, uh, the Virad is the route with most advantages for the population. You don't like the Virad, do you? No, sir, I do not, and I won't have it spoken of. Well, I shouldn't worry. If we consider the paramount objective to be an unbroken line of railway to Vancouver Island, the only route open for selection is yours, is Butte. On the other hand... Uh, oh, God damn it, Mr. Fleming! <laughs> Through it all, Mackenzie did his best. By now, he was plagued with all the symptoms of political tensions, including insomnia and intestinal inflammation. He seemed incapable of delegating authority or of solving the political problems created by the railway. And the people began to wonder how much longer could he last. During the Mackenzie years, Rideau Hall here in Ottawa was occupied by a young and vigorous Governor General, Frederick Temple Blackwood, Viscount Clandeboy and Earl of Dufferin. I get the impression, you know, that the government sometimes thought he was a bit too vigorous. He was a great speechmaker and a bit of an egotist. He used to send out advanced texts of his speeches, liberally peppered with the word applause. In his speeches, he talked a great deal about the need for national unity. 
But now there were graver matters. British Columbia was champing at the bit, threatening to leave Confederation, because the railway still hadn't been built. So Dufferin interfered. He brought in the British colonial secretary to arbitrate the dispute with British Columbia. And as a result, BC agreed to extend the deadline to accept a delay in return for a sum of money as compensation. And that caused increased tensions between East and West and certainly raised the hackles here in Ottawa over British interference in a purely Canadian matter. Are we going west? Yes. Frederick, will there be anarchists? People like that? Never. That's precisely why we're going. Put a stop to all that before it begins. Redempt your anger. Withdraw. Your Excellency. Prime Minister, how good of you to come. As always, my lord, it is good of you to take the time to see us. Mr. Blake, I'm very glad to see you here. Up until now, I haven't had the opportunity of sounding you out personally on the idea of my going west. By the spring of 1876, Mackenzie had been able to persuade Edward Blake to re-enter his cabinet. They still did not see eye to eye on the railway, but they were equally appalled by Dufferin's latest suggestion that the Governor General himself should go to BC, not with vice regal neutrality, but as a diplomat to speak for both Canada and Great Britain. But only my lord to say... Never that mind, Mr. Blake, I can guess. I mean only to say, sir. That the Crown must not appear to meddle. I'm very sorry, Mr. Blake, that you've not brought a more original opinion to this argument. Prime Minister, once more I urgently request that you use me in this situation. I cannot help but believe that my going to British Columbia can do anything less than bring them round in our direction. Very well. May I say this? If what Your Excellency proposes can be described as a formal progress by the Governor General through the province of British Columbia, then neither I nor the Prime Minister can possibly stand against it. Sir, Mr. Blake has said it exactly. Not a mission from the Dominion government. None of the ambassadorial overtones you have asked for, but only... But only a progress. Yes, sir. Well, I see I shall not get my way. Very well, gentlemen, Mr. Blake, Prime Minister. Excellency. Lord and Lady Dufferin took their tour west, and Victoria gave them a royal welcome, with a few broad hints about the railways scattered among the decorative arches that had sprung up everywhere. finally escaped from Victoria, and they came up here to the end of Butte Inlet. This is Waddington Harbor, because they wanted to have a look at those granite cliffs, which would have to give way if the railroad was ever to go across to Vancouver Island. Dufferin must have been exhausted, because for the past seven days, 10 hours a day, he'd been receiving delegation after delegation, all of them clamoring to have the railway brought down to Victoria. And he was dismayed to find absolutely no flicker of national feeling. We may take it for granted, I think, that the spending of money in their neighborhood, and not the railway, is the real thing to which the British Columbia people look.
next on the itinerary was a trip up Burrard Inlet and through the Fraser Canyon, here. Along the route the railway would take if it only went to the BC mainland. Lady Dufferin used the word pretty to describe her view of the Fraser Canyon. Well, it's not a word that an engineer would use, looking up at these high, glowering cliffs. All very picturesque, but the fact remained that these cliffs represented almost as many engineering impossibilities as Butte Inlet. Dufferin headed back from here to Victoria, with considerable sympathy for British Columbia and with the suspicion that Mackenzie, pushed by Blake, was trying to wiggle out of Ottawa's commitments. Most earnestly do I desire the accomplishment of all your aspirations. And if ever I have the good fortune to come to British Columbia again, I hope it may be by rail. But the horrid BC business, as Dufferin called it, wasn't over yet. When he got back to Rideau Hall in Ottawa, Dufferin still wanted Britain to re-enter the picture. Your Excellency, I will say this one last time. The matter is settled. My colleagues and I are agreed that there is nothing more to be done except to proceed with the construction of the railroad as fast as the resources of the country will permit. But my honor is involved here. Not only my honor, but the colonial secretaries as well. For we have been ill-used by you gentlemen. Arbitration has been submitted through our good graces, and you turn it down. Mr. Mackenzie, I urgently request that you reconsider. I ask you to see the wisdom and the necessity of allowing this report of mine to go to the British Colonial Office. My lord, we have said all this before. This is Canada, my lord, where it does not sit well that a colonial secretary in far off Britain should be so ready to meddle with affairs that have no direct bearing on imperial interests. As to your honor, my lord, if my ministers turn your wishes down in concert, then your honor must submit to it. The ministers of any government are answerable only to the parliament, and well you know it, sir. There is no higher authority to whom they must answer, none, not even to you. You will go too far, Mackenzie. You, my lord, have gone too far. You ask us to submit to arbitration once again when already there are voices on every side shouting at us what we must do. It is enough that I must endure the shouting and abuse from British Columbia and the East. The bargain is hard enough to honor as it is, my lord. I beg of you, leave it alone. Prime Minister, this is not interference, nor is it meddling. It is advice. Sir, you had no mission from the government of this dominion. If that report embodies anything more than a purely personal view of these matters, it cannot, and it will not be sent. You press very hard, Mr. Blake. Prime Minister, once more I offer this advice. And I reject it, my lord. I will not accept your advice. We have nothing more to say to each other on this matter. Indeed, there is nothing more to be said beyond that which I owe you in respect of your office. But I feel constrained to warn you, my lord, that there can be no arbitration. And I will no longer submit to your urging of it. I have already offered you my resignation, my lord. If you now feel that you must request it, then I offer it to you again. For if you persist in offering me your advice, then I fear you must find someone who better suits your views of what this country is about, and that's all I have to say. You know very well there is nothing I want less than your resignation. Very well, I admit I may not advise your government at the official level. But what if you're wrong? But we are not wrong, my lord, in this matter. If you are not wrong, Mr. Blake, then where is the railroad? Good God, sir, it's been offered over and over again. Either you build the railroad, or you make sufficient recompense to British Columbia and get out of it. 
but you will do neither. My lord, the recompense was offered, but it was refused. Now all we can do is offer them the promise of the railroad, and at time it will be honored. When? I cannot say, my lord, when the country can afford it. But never at the expense of the eastern taxpayer. Never. That was your promise. And the promise of the British colonial secretary. Mr. Blake, you have deliberately misinterpreted that document. And in the Commons, too. Well, Mackenzie? You have your answer, my lord. And my request that we might break this meeting off. I have not my answer, and you shall not leave until I do have it. Prime Minister, I call on you to answer. I have that right, and I insist. My answer to what matter, my lord? On this report. On the railroad. On what you intend doing about compensating British Columbia. What will you do, sir? Well? That, my lord. I take it the interview is concluded? Your Excellency? Indeed it is. Well, that was an extraordinary scene. But it actually happened the first time in Canadian history, in fact, the only time, in which a Governor General and his own First Minister almost came to blows. And those are Lord Dufferin's own words. Well, the next morning they all cooled off and they decided to postpone a decision for 18 months until the surveys were completed. More political procrastination. By 1877, 46,000 miles of Canada had been reconnoitered, with 25,000 benchmarks like this one, and 600,000 surveyor stakes scattered all the way from the Shield to the Pacific. It had cost thus far three and a half million dollars and the lives of 38 men. There would be very little respite for the surveyors, but there'd be none at all for Alexander Mackenzie. What was really killing Mackenzie was the business of letting out railway contracts. He publicly attacked political patronage, but out of one batch of major contracts worth $5 million, almost the entire amount went to prominent liberals and his public works offices became a brokerage. Anyone could put in a bid, uh, even someone who had no intention of building the railway. And it certainly wasn't hard to find out who the other bidders were and how much they'd bid, because these seal tenders were just thrown into an unlocked drawer here in the public works outer offices. As one contractor said, you went to a clerk who made $1,000 a year, and he offered him $2,000, and the information was yours. And then you could sell your low bid to a higher bidder, and you'd both profit, though the country would lose. It cost the Mackenzie government about a million dollars at this time. And so there was poor old Mackenzie, swept into office on a pledge to clean up corruption, caught in the middle of the very thing he'd promised to stamp out. And even if by some miracle he did build the railway to the Pacific, he was surrounded by people who couldn't agree on the correct route. You term these suggestions, Mr. Smith. You want to extend the surveys of the Pine Pass region. That seems to me a suggestion somewhat lacking in justification. As to your other suggestion, that you should go west and take part in one of these surveys, that, of course, is entirely out of the question. Surely you realize the cost is too great. Look you, Mr. Mackenzie. Look you, Mr. Smith. You were taken on here to replace Mr. Fleming in his lamentable absence. That you should plan to go traipsing over the continent is, to say the least of it, outrageous. If you plan to do any surveys, sir, you will do them here, at your desk. Prime Minister, there I... will be no argument, Mr. Smith. That's the end of it. <laughs> Two of a kind.
Within a year, Fleming was called back to Canada by a desperate Mackenzie to deal with the incredible Marcus Smith. The volume of your correspondence, Mr. Smith, has been very telling. Now, to me, with regard to the Prime Minister, to me, with regard to the Governor General, to me, with regard to Sir John A. Macdonald, to me, with regard to me, all complaining, every one of them. And now, this, an unauthorized press release regarding the Pine Pass region. Mm. So much better in every way than the barren surroundings of the Yellowhead. And, and so well connected to Butte Inlet. To disobey deliberately your orders, to undertake unauthorized surveys, and to force the Prime Minister to circumvent me in order to get the proper work done. All of which makes a very sad state of affairs. It's especially sad when you think I've come all the way back from England just to relieve you of your duties. Did I hear what you said? I hope so. I'd not like to get all the way back to England only to discover that you hadn't understood me. Relieved of my duties. Did you say that, Mr. Fleming? Aye. I said that. But that was not the end of Marcus Smith. He uh, had a way of holding on, and he would plague and nag Fleming and the government and ultimately the CPR. Long after Fleming's eventual resignation, Marcus Smith would still be there. It was clear by now that Fleming's days as engineer-in-chief were numbered. He was certainly one of the most brilliant engineers this country has produced, but his department was rife with dissension and his survey costs exceeded all official estimates. Out in British Columbia, he'd ordered far too many of those detailed instrumental surveys where simple explorations would have done. But here on the shield, his hasty and skimpy surveys would cost the contractors many months of extra work and the government many extra millions. He really was overworked, supervising the construction of two railroads, struggling with his concept of standard time, hobnobbing with the Prince of Wales in Paris. Overworked, yes, but also overcautious. Though I don't think we can blame Fleming entirely, because you see, he had to keep those surveys going while the government played politics. They were always forcing incompetent, untrained people on him. But old Fleming survived it all and strode into the history books without a scar. The story of his work on the Canadian Pacific Survey is tangled and confused. It's neither black nor white, because it involved neither saints nor villains, but a hastily recruited group of very human and often very brilliant men faced with superhuman problems. expect to be benefited by offices they are unfitted for, by contracts they are not entitled to, and by advances they have not earned. Enemies ally themselves with friends and push their whims to the front. Mr. Speaker, I have been accused of being a weak Prime Minister. Well, I can answer that charge. A weak Prime Minister would have ruined his party in an hour and the country in a day. 
By heaven, I say, it is impossible for any man to conduct public affairs in this country without being subjected to the most vile, to the grossest of political abuse. Let a friend be given a contract, and at once it is said he got it because he was a friend. Let an opponent be given a contract, and we are charged with trying to buy him over to the government. could have carved those words on Mackenzie's tombstone. Undoubtedly, that would be one of the major causes of his death. And certainly, he was not the man to build the impossible railway. Though I rather doubt that MacDonald could have done much better in those Depression years. But if they didn't find somebody, somehow, pretty soon, to get that great project underway, the country would be in serious trouble. <laughs> 